Hey, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a very biased collection, of course. Um, I'm continuing trying to ramble a bit about the millennium's problems. Um, and I started with the Riemann hypothesis because the Riemann hypothesis, everyone needs to start with it. It's kind of the most, in some sense, well, it depends a bit who you ask, but if you put many enough people in a room, um, enough mathematicians say in a room and ask what is the most important conjecture, you will get the Riemann hypothesis, uh, kind of probably like 80% of the time or something. Anyway, and the rest of the series is then ordered by how difficult I find it to explain the problems. And I feel like this one, the Poincaré conjecture, we will come back to that. That's not really a conjecture. It was never a conjecture. It was a theorem. It was never, blah, blah, whatever. We'll see. We come back to the history uh, in this video. But I find this one kind of the easiest to explain. I have a previous video on, on, on it in a, in, in a series about geometric topology, but I'm trying to do it in a, now in a, well, precise way without any background knowledge. Well, whatever without any background knowledge means, hopefully a bit of a topology will be sufficient to understand what's going on. And it's a really non-obvious conjecture. Uh, so Paul Carré reformulated it several times. I uh, will come back to that as we go there, uh, as we go along. But it essentially is the idea that if something looks like a sphere, then it better has to be a sphere. And by a sphere, I really just mean some object of this form, which is hollow. We'll come back to that uh, also in a second. But essentially it starts as follows. So Paul Carré and many other people before came up with certain types of notions, which we nowadays uh, call n-dimensional manifolds. And in this video, in case you're an expert, my manifolds have no boundary, manifolds have no boundary, okay? Anyway, um, an n-dimensional manifold is really, this is a beautiful picture here that I stole. It's really such that every point has an n-dimensional disk as a neighborhood. So here is the is a one-dimensional picture. So what is a one-dimensional disk? A one-dimensional disk is just a line. And as you can see here, every point has a nice line neighborhood in the topological sense. So it doesn't really need to be a line. It can be bended a little bit, but it's topologically a line. Every neighborhood is topologically a line. Um, here's a 2D disk, which is really just a coin. Uh, just to make that sure, disks are kind of filled in between. And in order to make that really clear, here's a 3D disk, which is a, I, I usually have a picture of a golf ball in a mic. It's really, it's really filled. So this is just cut open, as you can see that it's filled, but I really have uh, the golf ball in mind um, of a 3D disk. And then you can generalize 4D disk, 5D disk, whatever. Some people call it ball instead of disk, uh, but anyway. Here, the 1D sphere is a bit boring because, uh, well, whatever, the boundary is S0, so for dimension D, the boundary is always D minus 1. And you just fill it in with a line. Maybe more exciting is this example, where you just fill in the disk and you get uh, the coin or the golf ball, which really is just uh, filled in this type of space here. You just fill it in and you get the golf ball. Right, so that's that's a uh, oops, that's a disk, okay. and up to a technical condition, which I'm completely hiding here. Uh, we will study uh, closed objects of this form, and closed really just means I can put it in a sack. Uh, just uh, just just what it is. I can put it in a sack. So, for example, uh, if I have my little uh, sphere in S two, and I can just put it in a sack, it's bounded. So here, this is supposed to be a little sack, whatever. I can put it in a sack and it's bound. So for example, I could put S1 in a sack, so X1, S1 is good, but here's another one dimensional space R, which I cannot put in a sack. So this one is not closed. So I would like to study something that is a certain type of sense by now. So for example, in my definition, which I haven't told you because I'm not telling you the technical condition, in this definition, um, the example would be, uh, there is only one, one dimensional manifold, one closed one, and it is the circle itself, so we are S1, the one-dimensional sphere. And if you do the same in two dimensions, well, the two-dimensional sphere is a soccer ball, S2. Um, but then it's not longer true anymore that the only closed surface, in this case, that's the jargon here, surface, is the sphere, because if, for example, you have, this is a normal color, give me another try, you have, for example, uh, the torus. So here, the torus T, the torus is not the sphere, not S2, 
uh, but it's another example of closed manifold. So the correct condition to add here to distinguish them is this what I call SC, which really just means simply connected. And it's really just saying you could shrink every curve to a point. So here in this wonderful animation uh, for the sphere, there's a belt on the sphere, and I, I, the animation shows you how to shrink it to a point. And here for the torus, it is not possible. There are many, many curves on the torus. For example, that something that just goes around the swim ring, uh, which you can't train to a point. But all of these are two-dimensional manifolds because we can just always draw a little disk around each point. Uh, so the correct distinction here between the sphere and the torus is that the only closed, simply connected surface is a two-sphere, uh, so a sphere, a soccer ball. And Poincaré just they thought about the three-dimensional case, which is like really, really, really difficult. Because not the following here, the two-dimensional sphere, the two-dimensional closed sphere, actually only makes sense in three space, right? The 2D sphere makes only sense in three space. And that's a problem. That's really, that's really a problem because then the three-dimensional sphere, the easiest three-dimensional manifold, will only really make sense in three space. So Poincaré then thought about dimension three in a famous series of papers, if you want, uh, analysis situs, and this is a, <laughs> a compliment. So in addition, addition to analysis situs, and it's the fifth edition to analysis situs. So Poincaré wrote in um, in French, and usually this is contributed in 1904, but it actually was in 1903 already. A little bit difficult. Let's say it was 1904. It's always a bit difficult when you submit or when you get it published. Blah 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 blah. So let's say about 120 years ago. So Poincaré wrote his fifth edition, which essentially really was about three-dimensional case. And Poincaré was just like, hmm, so maybe, maybe what we have seen so far, so in 1D it was kind of obvious because there is only one, one object anyway. In 2D it wasn't quite obvious, but it works. So maybe it's still true in 3D. The only close simply connected three manifold is a three sphere in this case. And Poincaré formulates it as a question uh, for a reason I'm going to indicate later, or I'm trying to guess later, but to be completely precise. But note here's a difference. If you ever write a paper yourself and you're thinking about writing down a conjecture, conjecture is something really strong. It kind of indicates that you have done many calculations, whatever that means, computer, not computer, whatever that means, and you're convinced that this is true, but you can't find a proof. A question is more like, yeah, I don't really know. Here's a question for the reader. So this is much, much, much weaker than a conjecture. It's still called the Poincaré conjecture. I would guess because people are just more excited about proving a conjecture instead of proving a way or kind of answering a question. But anyway, strictly speaking, it was a question. So Poincaré was really careful and for a reason that I'm trying to indicate in a second. But first, let's go to the theorem. So here's the theorem. It turns out from the Millennium Prize problems, this is the only one that is actually solved. So the answer is yes. So Poincaré's question, Poincaré's conjecture, is actually true. And yeah, if you want to think about a three-dimensional sphere, so here I tried my illustration. So two-dimensional sphere, if you want, is a movie. Movie gives you the extra dimension of a one-dimensional sphere. So a three-dimensional sphere is a movie of a two-dimensional sphere. Just a little bit for fun. But anyway, the theorem, which is now a theorem, is most of the time uh, contributed to Perelman, which is a bit unfair and in some sense fair at the same time. So we as human like to just, uh, I, guess, I guess, like to associate faces to things or names or whatever. That's usually contributed to Perelman who finalized the kind of work that was around for a long time. So for me, the Poincaré conjecture, the Poincaré question is usually a really, really beautiful example of how the community as a whole can actually push kind of, kind of research. So there was a lot of progress over the 100 years from uh, between Perlman's final proof and uh, the statement of the conjecture. And really, the community worked on this hard, very hard. So if you, I, I would have guessed now that I have no, no way to make this precise. But if you would have taken a poll when the Millennium Prize conjectures came out, like around the surface of the Millennium, which is the most likely to be solved, it was probably the Poincaré conjecture because there was already so much work by so, so many people. So I usually like to contribute the theorem 
to have to Perlman, of course, but also to the many, 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 many other people who've worked on this, on um, various versions of this conjecture, proving knowledge, uh, advancing knowledge in general, which is kind of really, really, really amazing. I have given you some examples, uh, some names you really read, like Smail or Friedman, uh, along those lines, but there's also Hammond, and there's many, many more for people. It's really a beautiful example how the community can work together as a whole. And just as a fun fact here, the 4D version is like still very, very, very open in some sense. And but by, by, to be more precise, it's Bruce 4D version is still very, very, very open. But that's part of another video. But let's move uh, to Poincaré and how Poincaré re re revisited really this conjecture, this question, whatever you want to call it, uh, several times. So originally, Poincaré was like obvious, I don't even state it. And then got a little bit more careful um, in one of the, as I said, five revisions of the original paper uh, or additions to the original paper, and essentially had this idea that homology detects spheres. So homology is not quite what I showed you. If you know a little bit how, about homology, then homology is the abelianization of what I just showed you. But anyway, in uh, 1904, 1903, whatever, Poincaré found a counterexample to this statement which is that would later have to become known as Poincaré sphere, uh, Poincaré homology sphere, because it has the same homology as the sphere, but it's not a sphere. And the construction, not quite due to Poincaré, Poincaré was using Haycard's diagrams. Um, but anyway, the construction that is most popular nowadays is that you, you can construct, uh, so this is filled, that you can construct a three manifold by gluing opposite sides of a dodecahedron together. So here, in this picture, this is a, kind of the graph of a dodecahedron. C1, you glue this to C1, uh, or for example, whatever, C5, you glue this, now I need to find it, to C5, and you glue all of them together, and it's filled, so you get a three manifold, and uh, this one has the homology of a sphere, but it's not a sphere. So uh, the fundamental group is non-trivial, but its abelianization is trivial. And this is not so easy to find, actually, in particular if you haven't seen it before, like Poincaré. And that's maybe why Poincaré gets so careful by then revisiting the question from homology to what I showed you, like fundamental group, which is an equivalent formulation. Fundamental group is trivial. And maybe that's why Poincaré calls it eventually a question, not a conjecture, because it's actually really subtle. And it's kind of surprising that it works out in some sense, because my first guess, kind of bias, but what I know nowadays, ignoring that I know the real answer, that that's that's right. This is this really wrong. Let's try to we try to ignore the real answer. Maybe I would have guessed homology as well. But homology doesn't work. There are infinitely many homology spheres, which are like not super trivial to consider. So maybe that's why Paul Perret got so careful and called it a question and not a conjecture. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.